fall over now in the middle of the sunset. That is a problem with relying on the unreliable now. We take grasping on to the things that cannot be grasped because they are inherently unreliable. Now. That is a problem in this world that you stand, and as soon as you stand there, someone, who is that someone? Someone of this nature. Nature grabs the carpet, pulls the carpet around your feet, uh, and you stumble, you fall over, uh, and you hurt yourself as a consequence. Uh. And uh, there's a nice, uh, the way it says here, it's, you know, the uh, idea of the uh, <clears throat> life in any world is unstable, it is swept away. There's a nice simile, actually, there's a number of similes. There's one sutta which is and sometimes we have on this retreat called the Araka Sutta. And the Araka Sutta is that is saying to live a long time ago. It's not really a, he was not really a Buddhist, but he was practicing samadhi, had some very profound samadhi experiences. And, and the Buddha tells the story of this Araka. And this Araka he taught his disciples uh, in terms of this seven similes, I think it is. Uh, and one of the similes he compares life to a stream, a swift mountain stream. Uh, carrying along lots of flotsam as it kind of carries, you know, goes down to the ocean. Uh, and life is this restless mountain stream going on fast, yeah? We run around in the world, craving in the driver's seat, uh, restlessly moving on. And as we do that, uh, all the flotsam, the, you know, we kind of, uh, we, there's all these, um, uh, what is it called again, in the, <laughs> the idea of, um, uh, uh, what was it, the word, the military word, when you kind of, when you have all this, all the civilians <coughs> die on the way, what, what do they call that? Casual, you know, uh, yeah, okay. Collateral, collateral damage. damage, you have all this collateral damage, because you go through the world, yeah, and all the collateral damage that you get as you go along, yeah? not really caring, not having enough uh, compassion for the world around you, being ruthless or whatever, you know? and this is the consequence of craving, craving stops you from being here. Uh, uh, doing the right thing and living in the right way. Huh? This is a stream, the, the life just being uh, driven on in this way. Huh? It's a nice way of thinking about life. Huh? The stream is moving on and on and on. Huh? So life is swept away in the process huh, as you do that. Huh? So it's a nice way uh, of thinking about life. And you can see here that Buddha just summarizes the uh, Dharma in a very brief statement. Huh? And then it's up to Rata Palama, it's up to each one of us to actually grasp what is being said. Uh, and if your faculties are clear and you're ready to hear these things, uh, it will have a massive impact on you when you hear these things. Uh, life really is, everything is unstable, everything is unreliable. What are you going to do, man? What are you going to get out of here? That's the answer here. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, the next one. Uh, uh, then the king says, It is wonderful, O Mother, but it is marvelous how well that has been expressed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. Life in any world is unstable, it is swept away. It is indeed so. Master of the Father, there exist in this court elephant troops, and cavalry, and chariot troops, and infantry, here, which will serve to subdue any threats to us. Sir. Now, Master of the Pala said, life in any world has no shelter and no protector. How should the meaning of that statement be understood? What do you think, Great King? Do you have any chronic ailment? I have a chronic wind ailment, Master of the Pala. Sometimes my friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives stand around me thinking, now King Kurabia is about to die. Now he is about to die. What do you think, Rene King? Can you command your friends and companions, your kinsmen and relatives? Come, my good friends and companions, my kinsmen and relatives. All of you present share this painful feeling, so I may feel less pain. Or do you have to feel that pain yourself alone? I cannot command my friends and companions. Uh, in this way, Master of Apala, I have to feel that pain alone. Great King, it was on account of this that the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened, said, Life in any world has no shelter and no protector. And when I knew and saw and heard this, I went forward from the home life into houselessness. And um, this is the idea that uh, we have to take responsibility for our own lives. You can't really... In the end, there's no one else who can look after you. You cannot, you know, this is one of the places here, the protector here, there is no shelter, the protector, the probably what is Abhisara. Isara means like a lord. It means like it's one of the words used for a creator, creator god or a god in ancient India. 
there is no, no one there out there who can ask for uh, favors from and say, oh, please help me, it's desperate. Uh, yeah, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you have to take responsibility for your own life. And sometimes that's quite scary. I, you know, I think one of the, perhaps one of the reasons why people, why it's nice to believe in a God, because it's kind of nice to have a, have a, you know, a mother and father, mother and father out there who kind of help you out. That's kind of one of the, maybe at least one reason for why people, uh, you know, have such beliefs, perhaps. Uh, because it is kind of it's something, you know, just, and it's kind of scary to give up that belief and give up the idea of a creator God or a personal God in your life who can interfere on your behalf when things are going wrong. Yeah. You can see why that is the case. So, and uh, but the Buddha says, actually, it doesn't work like that. Uh, there isn't anyone out there who can ask for favors, who can support you and hold things up, but you have to take responsibility. Yeah. And it's kind of surprising to me sometimes, even in the Buddhist world, uh, yeah, and also Buddhists who and pray to the Buddha, huh? yeah, Buddha, please help me, it's desperate, I need a new car. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah and this is kind of in the Buddhist world, you can't pray for the Buddha, he's not right there, he died two and a half thousand years ago, he's not going to listen to your, your help prayer, is it? And even, even if he, and, and, you know, even if you are, if you believe in the Creator God, if everybody asks this Creator God for favor, he's going to be overworked. So you know, it's going to be too hard for this poor creator God to sort everyone out. Uh, it doesn't really make any sense to have a creator God or a personal God to ask for favors for. Uh, and even among Buddhists, even if you don't ask the Buddha for favors, it is also very common in uh, India, for example, or parts of Southeast Asia, it is very common to have your own little deity, a little deity that looks after you. Uh, very common to have a shrine in your back, uh, in your garden somewhere, and have a shrine, you kind of, uh, you know, you make little offerings to the local deity or whatever. It's a very common thing also in Buddhist families and Buddhists because of the mix of Buddhist beliefs and uh, more like Indian beliefs, yeah? The ancient Indians, uh, which always had this idea of lots of uh, God that interfere in their life and can help them out and sort things out. Uh, in India, everybody has a personal God, uh, yeah? That's a kind of very important part of the Hindu tradition, the Hindu religion. Uh, but it doesn't really work like that. Uh, is, it, is it impossible to get some day, day to look after us? Maybe not absolutely impossible, but they are busy. Yeah, they are enjoying themselves in the world. They may not be listening to your prayers. Uh, you can't rely on that. Uh, just like you can't rely on humans, you can't always rely on demons either. Uh, so you don't know. Ultimately, uh, you take responsibility. Uh, and there's something very powerful when you do that, when you move away from the idea of there being something out there that can always support you. Uh, and you move to the idea of taking responsibility for the mind. Although it may be scary to start off with, uh, after, after all, it's empowering. Uh, it empowers you. If there is a deity that is kind of ultimately responsible for your life, uh, you don't really know much about this deity. Are they, are they really out there for your benefit all the time? Uh, who knows what these deities do? Yeah, you don't really know who they are. Uh, but uh, so if you give that up and you take responsibility, certainly it is in your hands. Uh, and now you know that you can do whatever is required for yourself to live well and to create your own happiness, create your own satisfaction in life and all of these kind of things. It is empowering to move away from that and move towards a Buddhist idea of how to live. You take responsibility and it's a positive thing. So this is one of the few places where the Buddha kind of makes it clear that we cannot really rely on any kind of external powers to support us in life. It is up to us to make our lives into something, something positive. And uh, I think actually that's a wonderful thing here. Yeah. And once you kind of get the uh, hang of that, and once you understand that, actually it's a, it's a great thing that it, it is that way. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you don't really know what's going to happen. Yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna let's go on to the next one. Yeah. Uh, it is wonderful, but it is marvelous how well that has been expressed by the blessed one who knows and sees, uh, accomplished and fully awakened. Life in any world has no shelter and no protector. Uh, it is indeed so. Master of the Pana, there exists in this court abundant gold coins and bullion stored away in the vaults and locks. Now, Master of the Pana said, life in any world has nothing of its own. Who has to leave all and pass on. How should the meaning of that statement be understood? What do you think, Great King? You now enjoy yourself, provided and endowed with the 
five kinds of sensual pleasures, uh, the, you know, the five senses. Uh, and will you be able to have it of your next life? Let me likewise enjoy myself, provided endowed with these same five kinds of sensual pleasures. Uh, or will others take over this property here, uh, uh, while you have to pass on in accordance to your actions? Uh, I cannot have it thus of the life to come, Master Abdapala. On the contrary, others will take over this property, while I shall have to pass on according to my actions. Great King, it was an account of this, that the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened Sangha, life in any world has nothing of its own, but has to leave all and pass on. And when I knew and saw and heard this, I went forth from the home life into houselessness. This is the theme we have been looking at before, that you cannot take anything with you. Yeah, you don't own anything in the end. Ownership implies control. Ownership implies that it is your to do whatever you do, what want with things. But these things actually belong to nature. And nature decides how long they're going to be in your possession, how long you're going to be able to uh, have these things. And then you're going to have to give it up. And it's all going to have to go. Nature's going to take it back again now. You don't really own anything. You borrow things in this world. Uh, the simile of the borrowed goods. Uh, and when it's time to go, uh, it is time. Uh, it is time to go. Uh, you can't take it with you. Uh. And uh, of course, the point here again is this idea that because of that, uh, you focus <coughs> on those things that you can take with you. Uh, and this, of course, here is called karma. But that karma is really just the qualities of your own mind, the qualities that you build up in this life. Uh, the qualities of kindness, etc., uh, all the things on the Buddhist path uh, that we try to do, all the virtues uh, and all the uh, building up of our character in a certain way. Uh, that is what you take with you. Uh, it changes your outlook. Uh, and if you realize that uh, well, all the things of this world are kind of irrelevant, uh, what really matters in the long run is the development of your character, then why not go the full way and just go for the full development of the character, become a monastic uh, and make that the centerpiece of your life and everything else just... Uh, I know, not be so concerned about that. Yeah, why? What's the point of having these relationships when you know eventually they're going to break up? Eventually, you're going to have to die. You're going to have to give up your wife or husband, your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is. You're going to have to go, and then you have to carry on on your own. Why invest so much in things that are going to have to end up in suffering? And these are the kind of reflections that eventually drive you towards the monastic life. There's always going to be some tension there. Craving is going to say, no, I want, to, I want to do these other things. And then the ideals, the higher ideals, the higher understanding wisdom is going to pull, pull you in a different direction. There's always this little bit of tension there as you try to negotiate this, this difference. So you can see why Urtapala may have gone forward after hearing about this thing. So. It is wonderful, Master Urtapala. It is marvelous how well that has been expressed <laughs> By the Blessed One who knows and sees, uh, accomplished and fully awakened, uh, life in any world has nothing of its own, uh, but has to leave all and pass on. It is indeed so. Now, Master Rapapada said, life in any world is incomplete, uh, insatiate, the slave of craving. Uh, how should the meaning of that statement be understood? Uh, what do you think, great king? Do you reign over the rich Kuru country? Yes, Master Adapala, I do. What do you think, great king? Suppose a trustworthy and reliable man came to you from the east and said, Please know, great king, that I have come from the east, and there I saw a large country, powerful and rich, very populous and crowded with people. There are plenty of elephant troops there, plenty of cavalry, chariot troops and infantry there. There is plenty of ivory there and plenty of gold coins and bullion, both unworked and worked, and plenty of women for wives. Uh, with your present forces, you can conquer it. Conquer it then, great king. What would you do? Oh, we would conquer it and reign over it, Master of the Father. That's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, great king? Suppose a trustworthy and reliable man came to you from the west, from the north, from the south, from across the sea, and said, Please know, great king, I come from this country across the sea, and it had all of these things in it. Conquer it, conquer it then, great king. What would you do? 
we would conquer it too and reign over it, Master Bhattaprabha. <laughs> Great thing, it was an account of this that the Blessed One would know and see the compilation fully awake and say that life in any world is incomplete and insatiate, the slave of craving. And when I knew and saw and heard this, I went forth from the home life into houselessness. And uh, this is, uh, this is, you know, what summarizes so many of the things that uh, I've been talking about before, the simile of the dog which goes from one butcher shop to the next one and, and never find satisfaction uh, always being uh, driven on driven on by the sense of being incomplete uh, or being this itch inside which is never satisfied this craving inside often very strong uh, driving you on and on uh, and this becomes very it becomes almost kind of ridiculous it becomes like a caricature of things uh, when you are a king you already have a country for yourself for goodness sake uh, the Kuru country, one of the largest countries in the north of India in those days. And uh, of course, that doesn't satisfy you. Huh? Yeah, one country is not enough. You've got to have more countries, of course. Huh? And so you keep on building up those countries. And of course, the point is, it is never enough. There is no such thing. You, you keep on going, and after a while, you have the whole Earth. But one Earth isn't enough. Huh? Then you kind of look out to Mars and Venus. Huh? Yeah, and Mars Venus actually are not that satisfying anyway, it's too hot and cold or whatever. So then you look at new uh, new solar systems, new galaxies, and when you have the entire universe, uh, then one universe isn't enough. Uh, and I think this is the reason I don't know if you've heard probably, some of you have probably heard about it. So uh, there is this kind of this modern idea of the multiverse, uh, that it isn't just one universe, but there's like almost like an endless amount of universes out there. Uh, and I reckon that was created by craving. <laughs> craving created that idea because they realized actually one universe isn't enough. Yeah, we need more. <laughs> That's what I reckon because I think it's a really ridiculous idea having endless amount of universes out there. <laughs> so, uh, but the point is, and this is kind of the point here, is that this hollowness, the sense of incompletion, the sense of not being satisfied, uh, the sense of this thing inside of you, something missing inside of you. Uh, it can never be satisfied by external things. Uh, these other things in the world, there's a psychological emptiness inside. Uh, there's something inside of you missing. It's like the psychology is a problem. Uh, they were trying to fill it up with external things. Uh, maybe you get a slightly tem temporary kind of, you know, small, dull satisfaction, uh, and then it carries on because you haven't actually filled up the gap inside of you. Uh, the hole inside of you is a problem. Uh, you're never going to fill that up by external things. Uh, the only way you can feel completion, the only way you cannot have the sense of being insatiated, always running after things, being satisfied, is by filling up the psychological hole inside directly. How do you do that? Well, this is the thing that we've been talking about all along. The way to do that is to create a happiness that exists in the present moment, a kind of happiness that has nothing to do with craving. Yeah, the happiness of kindness, the happiness of generosity, and ultimately the happiness of meditation itself. Well, in the present moment, you feel glad, there's no craving there anymore, and you realize that drive that always was driving you on, it's gone, disappeared, and it's no longer there. There is no more this drive, endless driving, driving around, driving you on from one thing to another one, with no real goal, with no real purpose, running for running's sake. That's what it is. That's what craving is, running around for running's sake. It is pointless. It's not actually going anywhere. Roaming around. One of the beautiful choices of translation by Bikibodi, the idea that you roam around Sansara. Right? What does the word roam mean? It means aimlessness. Yeah, you just roam. It is no, you don't, don't have any goal. You're not actually going anywhere. Right? It's just the up and down, back and forth. Now you kind of do this, now you do it again. Right? You're doing it for the millionth time. You think, million, is that enough? Right? Maybe, do I need to do this a millionth the first time? Right? Maybe not. Maybe I'm getting tired of doing this, you know, after so many times. Yeah, same old story. Growing up, you know, going through difficult teenage years, arguing with your parents or whatever it is, uh, when going to get yourself education and having your own teenagers, yeah, well, that's when you really get payback from the, those teenage years. <laughs> 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 and, 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 you know, you, you do that two or three times, surely that's enough, yeah? But no, you do it again and again and again. And after a million times, yeah, you still haven't really got it, but you start thinking, wait, well, let's have a look at these suttas. Maybe they're saying something interesting about this. Uh, Driven on, insatiate, the slave of craving. Yeah, there's a kind of this weird idea. We think that we are in charge. 
We think that crediting is our friend because it means that we pursue crediting. We credit like we pursue it, yeah? Oh, my, isn't that nice? Yeah, we fulfill our dreams, the cravings of this relationship and that or whatever it is, and that we pursue our dreams. Isn't that all the power of life? But this is the problem. It isn't. Yeah, the craving is actually a charge. Craving is the thing that is driving you on, that makes you restless and agitated. You are not in charge. Craving is in charge. Craving is leading you by the nose, yeah? And you are kind of following along like a sheep. That's what's going on. Why does it feel like we why does it feel like craving is a good thing? And in part it's because we identify with the doer. This is one reason why craving feels so nice, because when there is craving, we get a chance to express that identity. And expressing the identity of the doer is you feel satisfied with that, you feel happy with that. Yeah? You're indulging that feeling that you are the doer. And because you are expressing that, you feel fulfilled. Your identity uh, suddenly is, uh, uh, is being expressed through your actions. And of course, that is satisfying. Yeah? But once you start to realize that this identity is hollow, it isn't actually all that interesting after all, you start to become peaceful in your meditation, you start to get the point, wait a minute, maybe all this doing stuff actually is problematic. This is one of the things you start to see in meditation practice. And then, of course, craving also loses its pull, it loses its allure. Yeah, it's not only interesting, because craving and doing always have together, go together then. In fact, in one of the suttas, the Buddha says that we identify not just with the doer, but with craving itself. We take craving to be an aspect of who we are. And of course, that too is related with this idea of identifying with doing to the point where you identify with craving itself. You are literally identifying with suffering. Yeah, because craving is precisely a sense of lack. It is the distance between where you want to be and where you are. That's kind of craving, yeah. Yeah, it's identifying with a sense of lack. Yeah, and that is really identifying with suffering. And yet, yeah, that's exactly what we do in this life. So this is, when you look at these things, kind of uh, take a step back uh, and you start to look at these things. Yeah, the Buddha tells us, and you think, wait a minute, maybe he has a point. Uh, and you actually realize there is, there is something very profound and very useful going on here to teach us how to lead life in a more meaningful and satisfying way. Uh, so let go of that being dissatisfied, that it being insatiate, that going of being incomplete, or being the slave to craving. Let go of all that. And then that is where you find true satisfaction, true completion, true purpose, true goal, a true aim in life, something that actually is worthwhile. All the other stuff <coughs> is just endless suffering and endless problems. So. It is wonderful, Master Ratapala. It is marvelous how well that has been expressed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened. Life in any world is incomplete, insatiate, the slave of craving. It is indeed so. So, now, ready to go forward now to become an ethics? <laughs> So that, that, that's what he heard, yeah? And when he heard that, because he was ready, he thought, oh, this is it, I'm going to lie down, either I'm going to die, it's so important, either I'm going to die right here on the ground, or I'm going to go forward. Anyway, now what I'm going to do is to go back to the main sutta that we started, pretty much started out with, which is the simile of the elephant's footprint. And I'm going to just a, very briefly have a look at one more paragraph, or a couple of paragraphs on that one, before we go back to the uh, back to the mindfulness of rhythm. This is the third page from the beginning, roughly. Here. So if we count from the beginning, get to the third page, that's where we are at now. Here. <coughs> so, and um, we had a look at this uh, paragraph on full awareness, yeah? The, we become one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning it. And we've done that, and now we come to the next paragraph, which says, possessing this aggregate, or this sum of noble virtue, and this noble restraint of the senses, and possessing the noble mindfulness and full awareness, you resort to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, 
an open space for a heap of straw. Yeah, so this is a kind of a very important point here. Once you have reached a certain level of uh, virtue, you have kind of restrained yourself, uh, your mind is not all over the place, desiring here, becoming having ill will there, uh, and you've spent a lot of time purifying your conduct so that you have a sense of uh, satisfaction, you feel good about yourself in a kind of positive way, uh, and uh, you, you have a degree of happiness in your life. At that point, this is when you seek seclusion, because this is what this is all about, the seeking of seclusion. Yeah, so it's all about kind of finding things in the right sequence. And when the Buddha talks about seeking seclusion, as he does here, that is when we start talking about meditation practice. So this is where meditation really starts on the Buddha's path. Now, perhaps you think, well, what does that mean? Does that mean I shouldn't be meditating because I haven't really got to this point yet? Or what does it mean? It doesn't really mean that. What it means is that the real meditation, according to the Buddha, starts at this point. It doesn't mean that we cannot do kind of preliminary meditations that support us in our morality, support us in our conduct in life. Sure, we can do that, but it is not really quite the meditation the Buddha is talking about. Yeah? It's important to understand the distinction there, because then you understand when this, you know, where on the path you are. Yeah? And uh, that is always helpful for deciding what it is that you have to do you now. So we can always do a bit of meditation, just relaxing, just uh, getting into the present moment, do a bit of metta, do some death contemplation or whatever it is. We can, of course, we can do all of those things. Uh, but then, eventually, the mind becomes pure enough when the real meditation uh, starts to happen. So all of these places that you see here, yeah, the forest, the root of a tree, and all of these things, uh, these are kind of uh, standard places of seclusion. You withdraw from society. Uh, one thing which is missing here is an empty hut. Usually an empty hut is also part of these, uh, uh, this sequence. Uh, but uh, here it is missing. We'll see that later on. Uh. So, and that sets up the, um, uh, the sets us up for the next paragraph to help us understand what this next paragraph is all about. Uh. This is how, uh, how the next book part here goes. On returning from his arms round, after his meal, he sits down folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness before him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, or if you like, tiredness and lethargy. He abides in the mind free from tiredness and lethargy, recipient of light, mindful and fully aware. He purifies his mind from tiredness and lethargy. Abandoning restlessness and remorse, he abides unagitated. With a mind inwardly peaceful, he purifies his mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubt. This is what happens. You go on your arms round, yeah, you go to the dining room over there, that's your arms round, and yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, <laughs> after your meal, you come, no, after your meal, first of all, you go to bed for a while and you, you kind of relax a little bit. Uh, and then when you kind of ready, then you come back here and you sit down uh, and you fold your legs crosswise, or are you? So you lie really down if you have if you cannot do that, uh, or you sit on a chair, or all these kind of things, uh, and you set your body erect and you establish mindfulness before you. I will comment on all these things later on because these things are also part of the Anapanasati Sutta and what exactly how to do this. But all of this points to the idea that now we are doing meditation practice. Yeah, it is fairly obvious that is what is going on here. Huh? So we are getting into meditation. So. And that is the clue to understand what is going on next, because uh, the next part here is about abandoning the five hindrances. Uh, and it doesn't really tell you how to do it, it just says that you do it. Uh, so, so how do you actually do it? And the way you do it uh, is through the practice of Satipatthana, of right mindfulness. Uh, yeah, you are on it. Right mindfulness is the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah? Uh, 
And so this is what Kamala said. We have been working all the way to get to right mindfulness and meditation practice. This is what we are seeing here, is the uh, uh, right mindfulness of how to practice meditation. So this is done through Satipatthana practice, uh, uh, translated as, best translated perhaps as the applications of mindfulness, the focuses of mindfulness or something like that, uh, is an acceptable translation. Uh, so, and if you understand the Satipatthana, how it actually works, uh, you will see that it is all about uh, how to deal with defilements, with subtle defilements. Uh, especially if you go to the last of the four Satipatthanas, the Dhamma Nupasana, contemplation of Dhammas. Uh, and Dhammas here can be translated as principles, perhaps. Uh, it can also be translated as mental qualities, but I think principles is a good one because it really refers to cause, causality, causal principles, uh, how th everything is caused uh, according to the Buddhist teachings. Uh, so it shows you what this sutta said. I think I mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. Uh, it talks about, uh, you know, you know the hindrances, you know sensual desire, you know ill will, uh, you know its cause, why it arises. Uh, you know how it is abandoned, and you know how it remains abandoned in the future. So you understand the laws that uphold or uh, do not uphold these particular defilements of the mind. And you see that through direct insight into your own mind. Yeah? These things are not easy to see, because they are often so subtle. Because they are so subtle, it takes insight to be able to see these things. So that is what is going on here. So usually in the suttas, when the Buddha talks about the five hindrances, he is not talking about very coarse manifestations of these hindrances. He's talking about fairly refined ones. And the kind of last remnant of these defilements in the mind. We have already been dealing a lot with defilements already. We've been looking at how to use sensory strength, yeah, how to uh, overcome ill will and all these kind of things. So all the coarse defilements have already been abandoned at this stage. What remains is the refined, the upakilesa. Upakilesa means like refined defilements. And there's a whole sutta on those. Uh. So this, when the Buddha talks about the five hindrances, uh, usually that's a reference to upakilesa, refined hindrances in the mind, uh, and not kind of a coarse manifestation of them. Uh. This is the first thing to re realize. This is done precisely by practicing the four satipatthanas. Uh. So how do we practice the four satipatthanas? It is not obvious to read the satipatthana sutta. It says, yeah, you contemplate the feelings, this kind of feeling, that kind of feeling. Yeah. But it doesn't give you any context for how to practice these things. It doesn't say any particular meditation technique or any topic you take up or anything like that. You just know the feelings. And this is why the Anapanasati Sutta is so useful. Because according to the Anapanasati Sutta, simply by watching the breath, yeah, simply by staying with this very simple object of meditation, you fulfill the four Satipatthanas. That's all you have to do then. You do the whole practice of Satipatthana, the, all the insights, all the calm, all the uh, overcoming of the defilements of the mind that we're talking about here. All of that is done simply by watching the breath. That is all you have to do. It makes it so easy. Yeah, it's so simple. And because the Buddha, the only place in the sutras where he really explains how to practice Satipatthana in this way is in the Anapanasanda Sutta, I take that to be the main way that Satipatthana should be practiced. The way, probably, uh, because this is how the Buddha, only place where he really expresses it uh, uh, in, in this way. Uh. So that's what is going on here. This, this, may, this is quite hard to understand, isn't it? When you read this, you abandon the five hindrances, and actually you don't know what to do. But really, what you're supposed to do is watch the breath. Uh. Yeah, that is how you abandon this thing. It's not just watching the breath, there are other things as well. Uh. But that is the main kind of way of abandoning these things. Uh, so that's what is going on here, and that's why we're going to have to have a look, start having a look at the Anapanasati Sutta in a second. Uh, but uh, before I do that, uh, I just have a, just a very brief discussion of these five hindrances uh, because they are quite interesting. Uh, and uh, again. Uh, uh, Covetousness is not a very useful translation. Uh, sens sensual desire or just desire uh, is a good one for the first one there. Abandoning sensual desire for the world. Uh, yeah, the world is the world of the five senses. Uh, you have a mind free from sensual desire. Uh, you purify the mind <coughs> from this. Uh, and again, sensual desire is first. Uh, 
The second one is ill will, that one is five hindrances. And people often ask, how do I overcome the, the, the last three of these five hindrances? Uh, the tiredness and lethargy. Uh, I stop and talk where it's kind of slightly ancient vocabulary. Nobody uses those words anymore. <coughs> so tiredness and lethargy, I think it's better translation there. And uh, so how do you overcome this last of the five hindrances? The restlessness, uh, the remorse, and uh, the doubt. Uh, and uh, the answer is that the two most far most important of the five hindrances are the two first ones. Uh, and these two first ones are the ones that tend to keep the last three also alive. Uh, yeah, you get restless because you have desire. Desire fuels the craving, it fuels the agitation, it makes you do things. Uh, that's the whole purpose of desire. Yeah? Uh, you have ill will and you feel tired afterwards. Yeah? So the tiredness comes from this. Uh, Whereas the pursuit of all of these things also lead to tiredness eventually. Yeah. So this latter three hindrances don't have to worry so much about them. Uh, focus on the first two ones. That is where the problems really lie. Yeah. When the mind becomes incredibly still and you are approaching samadhi, that is where the last three hindrances become really problematic. And that's why sometimes uh, we can deal with the last three directly. But until the samadhi is really solidly established, uh, you're getting close to the jhanas, etc., until you get to that point, you don't have to worry too much about them uh, because they are mostly a result of the first two ones. Uh, that is a very important thing to realize uh, because you, you tend to fight the last three hindrances uh, when really that's not what the issue is, that's not what the problem is. Uh, the problem is in the first two ones. Uh. So deal with those. Uh, and again, uh, the most important one of those is, is obviously ill will itself. Uh. So um, uh, that that's the five hindrances. The last one of doubt is quite is also quite interesting. Uh, unperplexed about wholesome qualities. Uh, you know what is wholesome in the world. You know what is unwholesome. Uh, you're able to distinguish between the two. Uh, and very often we are not uh, because these things again are very subtle. Uh, so this is what doubt means in Buddhism. Uh, the ability to understand the difference between what is wholesome and what is not. Uh, that is really what that what comes down to doubt. People often talk about doubt, not really understanding exactly what it refers to. Uh, it's not just doubt about the Buddhist teachings. Uh, it's a very specific doubt about what makes you progress on the path and what hinders you. Uh, knowing uh, what to look for inside it, which qualities to build up uh, and which qualities to abandon specifically. Uh. I'm not going to talk much more about that. Uh, uh, a lot of talk could be said about these five hindrances, but I think that is enough for now. Because now what I want to do is to go to the Anapana Sati Sutta, the last sutta in the whole of all of these suttas. And uh, okay, so Mahdi Mani Kaya 118. And uh, one of the things uh, to realize about the Anapanasati Sutta is that it occurs in a number of places in the suttas. Uh, this particular scheme we're going to have a look at is a scheme of 16 steps of watching the breath. Uh, and that scheme occurs in a number of places in the sutta. So it is an important teaching. It's not some kind of marginal thing that is kind of on the side. It is act central to the Buddhist path. Uh, yeah, it's always good to know that which which suttas are kind of central, which ones are taught again and again, and which ones are more marginal. It's actually a very useful thing because you should always place the most emphasis on those teachings that are core teachings that occur again and again in the suttas. So uh, this is one of those teachings. This is the and it's found of course in the, in all kinds of languages in the Chinese, uh, in the canon which is translated to Chinese in. Uh, Tibetan, I'm not sure, but uh, in Sanskrit, all kinds of versions of the sutta. Anyway, this is how, this is what the Buddha has to say about this. This is just an extract from actually quite a long sutta which goes on about uh, how this is completed in many ways, but this is the core part of it. Uh, Bhikkhus, uh, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, uh, it is of great fruit and great benefit. Uh, when mindfulness of breathing is cultivated and developed, it fulfills the four applications of mindfulness. When the four applications of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, they fulfill the seven factors of awakening. 
but the several factors of awakening are developed and cultivated and they fulfill a true insight and deliverance. <coughs> Yeah, so this is the, uh, the beginning point of this, uh, and this shows you, and this is the thing that uh, people were asking about yesterday, about what you do after Anapanasati, yeah? What do I do afterwards? Uh, what do I do next? Watch the feelings in the body? Yeah. Well, actually, you don't have to do that, and this is what the statement here, right there, is so powerful. Uh, all we have to do is to watch the breath. Uh, as it says here, that it is of great fruit and great benefit. And when the Buddha says great, of great and great benefit, he really means great fruit and great benefit. It takes you all the way to the end of the path. That's what he's saying here. That you fulfill the four applications of mindfulness, the four satipatthanas. This is all you have to do to complete the satipatthanas. All four of them are completed by mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. And that is interesting, and I just want to kind of mention this very briefly because I think it is an important point. And for those of you who read the suttas, it is easy to get led astray by these tiny little things which are, you might call, incongruences between the suttas. One suttah does not match properly with another one, and you wonder what is going on there. And this is, I think, part of the problem with some of the meditation traditions because they have read one sutta without reading the suttas broadly and understanding how it all fits together in so when you read the Satipatthana Sutra, you have four Satipatthanas, four, it says here, foundations of mindfulness, but as I mentioned before, I don't really like that translation, four applications of mindfulness. So mindfulness has to be established, then you apply it to this object or these areas or whatever you want to call it. And the first one of these four is a contemplation of the body, Kaya Vipassana. Yeah? And Kaya Vipassana, and there's a large number, if you go to the Satipatthana Sutra, there's a large number of kind of exercises or ways of fulfilling that one. And one of them is uh, <coughs> contemplating the 31 parts of the body. Uh, yeah, not 32, but 31. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, I'm not going to. It's interesting. It's a small little point. Yeah, but whenever people say to me, they say, oh yeah, I'm contemplating the 32 parts of the body, uh, the Sutra only has 31. Uh, so where does the 32 come from? It comes from the Vasudhi Manga, because it added one more in the Vasudhi Manga. And straight away, I know, you have been reading the commentaries, you have really been reading the Sutras, yeah? This is how you pick up on what people, <laughs> on, on where these things come from, these teachings, because very often they are influenced heavily by the commentaries of the Abhidhamma, and little things like that actually give away the game straight away. Yeah? Anyway. <laughs> so, what, so you have the contemplation of the 31 parts of the body, it is a core aspect of body contemplation, yeah? You have the uh, four elements, is another fairly core one. Uh, these are things that exist across all the various traditions. Uh, you find the Satipatthana Sutta in a, a few versions in Chinese, uh, uh, you find it in, uh, uh, in Pali, of course, uh, and you find also, you find it in the Abhidhamma, which is interesting as well. You find versions in there as well. And when you compare all these various versions, uh, that is what we find, is that these are the core elements that exist across the board in the various versions. 31 parts of the body, four elements. So what about, but one of the things that is found in the body contemplation is the mindfulness of breathing. It is found in the body contemplation, but not in the Vedana contemplation, the contemplation of feeling, nor in the contemplation of mind, nor in the contemplation of dhammas or principles. So and that is where this idea comes from, that when you do meditation practice, you start out with watching the breath. And once you have watched the breath, you know, then you go on to contemplating the feelings in the body. Yeah, this is, we had that over there, this was a question. That's where it comes from, because according to the Satipatthana Sutra, you only watch the breath in the beginning, when you do the body contemplation. Then you move on to do the Vedana, the, the contemplation of feelings. But the problem is that this sutta here says that all you have to do to fulfill everything is breath contemplation. You don't have to move on to contemplate in the body. So there seems to be a discrepancy here between the Satipatthana Sutta on the one hand and the Anapanasati Sutta on the other one. So what is going on? And this is where it is so interesting to look at the Satipatthana Sutta from a historical perspective. Because the most foundational part of the, the Kaya Vipassana <coughs> is the 31 parts of the body, perhaps the four, uh, the four element contemplation, and not the mindfulness of breathing. The mindfulness of breathing is quite likely a later addition to the Satipatthana Sutta, because it does not exist across the border. 
Yeah. So if you take that out of the Satipatthana Sutta, mindfulness of breathing, then suddenly everything works out nicely. Because then uh, here it says that the mindfulness of breathing fulfills all the Satipatthana. So there is no conflict anymore because mindfulness of breathing is not actually in fact then mentioned at all in the Satipatthana Sutta. <laughs> Which is, which is fine, because then uh, it is in the Anapanasati Sutta that you find this particular way of developing the Satipatthana. So, so you can see, uh, I, am, I, am I being clear? Can you understand what I'm talking about? Uh, and these little things like this, uh, small little details like that, uh, if you investigate them properly, you can start to see how the suttas kind of fit together more naturally, more completely, uh, by uh, investigating carefully in this way. Uh. So this is why I say you don't have to start off with mindfulness of breathing, then do uh, feelings of the body. You can do mindfulness of breathing all the way through, because that is what the Buddha is talking about here, right in the Anapanasati Sutta. Yeah, that's all you have to do. And we will see in a second why it is that this fulfills the contemplation of feelings. It's actually very simple. Once you get your head around it, it's actually so easy. It's such a nice way of doing it rather than having to focus on the pain in the body. There are better ways of doing this. So, <laughs> <coughs> so then uh, you fulfill the four applications of mindfulness by the Anapanasati, then you fulfill the four applications of mindfulness. When you fulfill the four applications of mindfulness, you also fulfill the seven factors of awakening. And the seven factors of awakening fulfill true insight and liberation. Yeah, this is the end of the path. This is Arahantship. All the way to the very end. All you have to do is watch the breath. And it takes you all the way to becoming Arahant. Yeah, there it is, black on white. <laughs> and this can, you know, the, and this is the same across all the various traditions. So I think this is, must be <coughs> part of the Buddha's original teachings. So. so, how is it done? How do we do this? Now it's getting exciting, yeah? Because now we kind of have a background. Are you excited? Yeah, a little bit? Okay, not, not, not say too excited. Okay, excited enough. Yeah. So, so, the Buddha says, and how because is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated? so that it is of great fruit and great benefit. In other words, how is it cultivated? So it, it takes you to Arahantship. That's what he's saying. Yeah. And then he says, here, a bhikkhu, a bhikkhuni, a layperson, anyone, yeah, this is for everybody here, yeah. gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, sits down, yeah. having folded their legs crosswise, they set their body erect. And establish, having established mindfulness in front of them, then ever mindful you breathe in, mindful you breathe out. So this is the preliminary, the background for mindfulness of breathing. And as very often, this background information is some of the most important for understanding how the mindfulness or anything, how anything works. Because this summarizes all the things that have to be in place for mindfulness to breathing to work. Yeah. And the first one, again, that you will see here is that it says, gone to the forest, to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut. In other words, mindfulness of breathing, yeah, when it is practiced fully to the highest level, is something you do in solitude. Yeah. It is not something that you do as easily in company or with other people. You withdraw from the world. You start off getting the kaya viveka, the seclusion of the body. <coughs> from the seclusion of the body comes the chitta viveka, the seclusion of the mind. You have to get these things in the right order. Yeah? Because when you withdraw the mind from the company, yeah, it is like the mind becomes aloof. The mind aloof, maybe it's, it's kind of a, not a very, perhaps nice word. It sounds like somebody is a bit <laughs> snobbish or something. Yeah? But uh, it's this idea of being secluded, withdrawn from people, and then the mind also withdraws from the uh, stickiness, the attachments, all this infiltration in the world, uh, because we are physically secluded, first of all. Uh, yeah, so this, this meditation happens in seclusion. This is one of the reasons why we have retreats, or why we have retreat centers, uh, because when you go on a retreat, or you go to a retreat center, uh, this is why we have a Jhana Grove Retreat Center down in Perth, uh, because it takes you out of your ordinary environment. Uh, you, get a, you get a room for yourself. Down there, we have, you get your own room and bathroom down there in our, in our very fancy retreat center in Perth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you, uh, you, you are you taken out of your normal environment, and that already makes you feel a little bit secluded. Uh, 
because you don't have the same input that we normally have. When you go back to your own home, yeah, it's all your things around you all the time, and because you are a little bit bound to those things, it's more difficult to have that mind which is secluded in your own home compared to going to a retreat center or going away somewhere else. So it's useful to do that. And this is why we have retreat centers, they're kind of a halfway house between full seclusion and, uh, and staying in your house. So this is the first thing, to remember that. It is ideally, this is a, a practice that happens in seclusion. Then you sit down. It is mindfulness of breathing happens in the sitting posture normally. It doesn't have absolutely to be in the sitting posture. There are in some traditions that do anapanasati while walking. Well, I wouldn't recommend it, it's very difficult to. And sometimes it can be done, done by lying down if you are very mindful already. But basically, it is a sitting posture thing here. It is when you're sitting, it's the ideal way of, of doing this. Yeah, so uh, that, that's also an important part of the instruction. Having folded your legs crosswise, so the ideal way of doing this is by sitting on your bottom with your legs crossed. This is kind of the ideal. But uh, remember that this was a this is done in part because we're talking here about ancient India. People would often sit on the floor. They would often have cross, have the legs crossed. They were used to this. Uh, yeah, it's not like these days. We're all kind of used to sitting on chairs all life. Uh, and then when you try to cross your legs, you can't do it because your legs are so stiff and you can't really you can't sit cross-legged anymore. Uh, so this, I don't take this to be an absolute instruction. Uh, I take this to be an ideal instruction if you are used to sitting cross-legged. And sitting cross-legged is quite nice, actually, once you get used to it. It feels very stable, it feels very solid. But uh, it is perfectly possible to reach very deep states of samadhi by sitting on a chair. There are many monks who sit on chairs in the meditation. Why? Well, one reason is because they have destroyed their legs trying to sit cross-legged too much. <laughs> so please don't make that mistake, because there comes a point where the pain is just so inscrutable, or inscru in whatever, not inscrutable, whatever it is, uh, excruciating, excruciating is a word. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, that, um, uh, you know, you actually destroy your legs quite literally, or your knees in particular. Uh, so use that chair before you do that, uh, and uh, you can get very deep meditation by sitting on a chair. Find a good chair, a chair that is sturdy, a chair where you sit fairly straight, yeah? I think these chairs we have here are actually not too bad. They are kind of roughly the right kind of chairs. And you sit there, and then you can do your meditation practice accordingly. Whatever makes you comfortable, that is the most important thing here. You want to get the body out of the way. Remember that. The body should not be a problem in meditation practice. That is the essential thing here. If the body is a problem, either because you find pleasure through it, or because it is too painful, it is going to get in the way when you try to watch the breath. The body should kind of be irrelevant, it should kind of disappear. It should be something which is kind of, a, you don't care about the body anymore. The body just sits there by itself and you're off, you know, your own little world in your, in your mind. That's kind of the right, the right kind of body. Sama kaya. Sama kaya, sama, right body. But that is, does not exist in the sutra, that, but I just made that up on the spot. So, uh, uh, and then you set your body erect, yeah? So you sit straight, and the idea, of course, is that when you sit straight, your mind tends to be clear. But again, you have to do this at the right time. Don't force yourself to sit straight from the very beginning. Start off by relaxing and just kind of sitting back. Some of the best meditators I know, they start off by leaning against the wall, yeah? And it's allowing things to calm down in the beginning, yeah? Allowing themselves, allowing mindfulness to arise, just listening back. Take some deep breaths and you allow your tiredness or whatever to get dispelled. And then, when mindfulness comes, starts to arise, then it's almost as if you naturally sit straight because you want to be straight when you're, when you're mindful because your mind is clear. Yeah, A clear mind almost demands a straight body. Yeah? And it almost happens by itself. There you are, whoops, non self. Yeah, it just happens by itself. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm, he, said, he, he does that. He says when he is tired, he had a long day, he starts off by leaning against the wall. Yeah, if Ajahn Brahm can do it, you can do it as well. Yeah, it's allowable. Yeah. He is an incredibly good meditator. When he gets into the meditation, he just sits down, closes his eyes, and then does bang, go up, and then boof, into Samadhi. That's how he, how he works those things. So, yeah, I mean, really, he is just really up there when it comes to meditation practice. So. So if he can lean against the wall, please, it is not a lesser kind of practice. It is, in fact, the high practice is to lean against the wall. 
York would be a very good company to do that too. So, uh, and then we have the last part here, having established mindfulness in front of him. And uh, uh, this is, again, uh, the reason, a thing, the reason why I've been talking so much about mindfulness on this retreat and how to get it established, first of all, is prime precisely because of this kind of instruction in the suttas. First you establish mindfulness, yet having established mindfulness, after you have established it, then you do the mindfulness of reading it. And this is why this is so important. And this is why how we live our daily life matters so enormously. Because that is where mindfulness is either gained or lost. Live your ordinary life really, really well. Live it absolute, as maximum well as you possibly can. Maximum well, whatever. <laughs> as well as you possibly can. And as you do that, you will actually help yourself. Every year when you come back on the retreat, you will find your mind is more clear. You have more presence and you're able to do the meditation better as a consequence. So you have to, ultimately, you're going to have to integrate your whole life into the spiritual practice. And as you do that, then it all comes together very nicely. And also, when you sit down, don't try to watch the breath until you have established mindfulness. If mindfulness does not get established for whatever reason, forget about watching the breath altogether. It's okay. Yeah? More important to get it right than to try to do something which isn't going to work. You're just going to get frustrated. Eh? You're going to get headaches. Somebody said they had headaches for years and years and years because they would just they would sit down and watch the breath straight away as soon as they sat down. Eh? And the only way you can do that is by using willpower because the mind isn't really ready. Eh? At that point, eh, once mindfulness has become established, that is where the mindfulness of breathing really commences. Eh? And that is where we're going to continue tomorrow morning. So uh, uh, be ready for tomorrow morning, and we will continue then and do the last part. When I do this retreat, I read the suttas until the last minute. Yeah, <laughs> and I, do. I don't waste any time. Kind of, kind of summarize. Well, I, sum I summarize. Take one minute to summarize the very end, but that's about it. Anyway, that's all for now, and we'll see you again at seven p.m. this evening.